Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Lawrence Neal is the founder of High Intensity Business, a business resource to help high-intensity training business owners generate more profit in less time. He also hosts the High Intensity Business Podcast, formerly the Corporate Warrior Podcast, where he's interviewed over 100 world-class health and fitness experts, including Sean Baker, Rob Wolf, Ben Greenfield, Mark Sisson, Doug McGuff, and myself. <laughs> uh, I've personally listened to Lawrence's show for five years, loving every episode, and Lawrence was the one who inspired and helped me to get Carnivore Cast started. It is safe to say the podcast wouldn't exist without Lawrence. He's one of the smartest, humblest, and most generous and genuine friends I've ever had. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Wow, that is the most kindest introduction I think I've ever had. I don't think much of it was true, but it was really kind. <laughs> of <laughs> Thank course. you so much. No, no, yeah. it's, it's all deserved and really happy to have you here. Um, so let's just start with of course. Uh, my audience. Some of them will be familiar, some won't, but what is high intensity training and what is high intensity business, um, your business? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so where to start? What is high intensity training? So I'm going to do my best to keep this relatively simple. Um, so high intensity training is really, really ambiguous um, because it's kind of become a bit of a cliche. You know, I someone asks me, Lawrence, how do you exercise? And I say, I do high intensity training. And they say to me, oh, yeah, I do the same thing. And I, I'm pretty certain that 99.9% of the time, that is not true. And that they're doing something completely different. They're doing some kind of high intensity interval training or, or something similar to that. Um, but originally, high intensity training was, I suppose, kind of invented by the late Arthur Jones, um, who I think popularized it around the 1970s. Um, and then there's a handful of other people who have since um, sort of taken the torch and, and, and uh, uh, you know, worked on high intensity training, developed it uh, as a way of exercising and, and, and marketed it. Um, and what it is exactly is a form of resistance training done with either machines or free weights or body weight. And um, typically where you're, you're doing maybe in the region of five to 12 exercises, both compound and, uh, so multi joint and single joint exercises. So anywhere, anything from sort of chest presses and pull downs and chin ups to things like leg extensions and bicep curls. Um, and typically sets are done uh, to a single set to muscular failure, um, whereas traditional training would take more of a, a multi-set approach. Um, I would say due to the focus on intensity um, and, and really training hard and training to muscular failure, um, by virtue of that, the workout regimes tend to be um, slightly more infrequent and briefer in duration. So the average workout probably lasts anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and typically most trainees work out once or twice a week and maybe three times a week on the more extreme end. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell what high intensity training is. Um, I will just say I, I think, you know, my, my goal really whilst I you know, I talk a lot about high intensity training and that's very much what my brand is about in a way. Um, I'm just really happy to see anyone doing safe forms of strength training, whether that's HIT or something that's more maybe traditional, which has multiple sets. I'm really not too fast um, because I think at the end of the day, the evidence seems to support that the outcomes are the same. Um if you're doing this type of training, so long as you are working to a, a, a high degree of um, relative intensity, which, um, you know, Scott can attest to because he's tried all sorts of different protocols. Um, and then moving on to myself and my business. So my, my 
my website is highintensitybusiness.com. Um, and what we do there is we help high intensity training business owners grow their business um, in terms of helping them with every function of the business, like sales and marketing and retention and pricing and packaging and hiring, etc. Um, but we also help them with the operation and the personal training side of things. And so I do a lot of content on um, everything with regard to personal training. Uh, and obviously, as I said just now, the high intensity training business side of things. It's kind of, you know, uh, changed over time. So when I first started the podcast, as you alluded to in the introduction, it was called Corporate Warrior. Um, and that was when I was more focused on the category of just optimizing lifestyle um, for busy people, which was something and is something I'm still very interested in. And and it's probably why I got you uh, interested in the show in the beginning, Scott, for uh, I'm sure it was a big part of that. And, uh, you know, in trying to find my own voice and trying to build a business, I niched down over time to really focus on this very, very niche um, group of individuals who are passionate about what I'm passionate about, which is high intensity training and growing businesses in this area and then trying to help them be successful. Um, so, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's an awesome introduction of both high intensity training and um, what you do. Really helpful. Um, and who is high intensity training for? Um, and maybe how did you personally discover it? Is this something, you know, some people would say it's only for old people. Some people think high intensity, that's only for like people who are, who are really intense, you know, uh, super <laughs> into fitness training. Who's it for? And, and how did you, how did you personally come about it? Talk us through that journey a little bit. Yeah. So I just start off with my own journey. So I, I've always been into health and fitness probably since my mid teens. So from like the age of probably 15, 16, and, you know, I got the bodybuilding bug, just like most young men out there, um, and tried everything under the sun to try and get the best results and try and build big muscles. Um, and so I was trying lots of different protocols, lots of different workout programs. And, um, along that journey, I started to, move more towards, you know, training that just seemed to be more evidence-based, that seemed smarter in its design. Um, and the first step in that direction was really picking up the Spartan Health Regime, um, which has a bit of a, you know, a hyperbolic title. Um, but basically, it was a, a an ebook based on the training and principles practiced by the Spartans. So it was very romantic and uh, very appealing to me at the, you know, the young age of 20, I think I was 21, 22, and I picked that up. But it was, you know, it was brief in its training design. Most workouts would be two or three exercises, uh, but it was quite frequent. I was training kind of, you know, six to eight times a week doing various different uh, exercise, be it strength training or grip work or running or basketball. And you know, some people might not call those things exercise and put them in the recreation category, but we're not really here to debate that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then after that, I it's, it's, it's kind of hard to try and pinpoint the moments, isn't it? But I think some of the main events that really led me down the high intensity training rabbit hole were coming across Dr. Doug McGuff's uh, presentation on the 21 convention, which I think you've seen. I've watched it multiple times. I think everyone in here has seen that practically. Um, it's just a wonderful presentation. You can find it on YouTube, I'm sure. Scott will link it up. Um, it's about, I think, two hours in length, but it's, it's a phenomenal presentation where Doug essentially gives you a crash course in biochemistry and um, talks you through how the cells in the body metabolize substrate and how that all works and how muscle gain works and fat loss and um, the role that exercise plays in all of that. And I'd never seen exercise articulated and talked about in such an intelligent way that that really triggered my curiosity. And then I think from there, I read his book, Body by Science, which is probably my favorite health and fitness book ever. Um, and then that was it. And then after that, I was sold. Um, I started practicing it for myself. You know, I literally, and this is no word of a lie, no exaggeration, I reduced my training down from what at the time was probably, as I said, six to eight sessions to one hard session a week. Now, I was still playing basketball, but probably only playing like once a week. So call that two times I was doing some kind of activity every week. Um, but my training session was only 15 minutes as well. Um, and so I did that and I kept that up and my results were better. You know, I, I put on more muscle mass, not a great deal of muscle because I'd already got probably a lot of my noob gains, as they say, uh, and my genetics, I'm sort of predisposed to more of a, uh, a, 
a, a lighter muscle physique anyway. Um, but I was able to burn body fat, um, probably get in the best body composition um, for me. Um, and yeah, and I felt great, had high energy. So yeah, massive gain in efficiency um, from my point of view. And so from then on, it was like I just developed a real passion for it. Um, and then that really drove me to want to create, um, obviously my, my business in it because, um, you know, I was so passionate about it and, uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was passionate about trying to promote it and increase the awareness of high intensity training to the masses. Um, but there was a second part to the question. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really helpful overview. And I just want to reiterate, I think you've said it twice now, but people so often get confused. They call high intensity interval training, which is something done on a wind gate or a rower or a treadmill or a hill, um, or with something like burpees. They call that hit. Um, or they call that high intensity training. What Lawrence is talking about is distinctly different and only involves, you know, using slow, controlled resistance training to failure. Um, and it's high intensity because you go all the way to concentric muscle failure. Um, I just want to like hit that point home one more time, Lawrence, even though you already made it because, um, people so often get that confused. I feel like it, it, it bears repeating. Um, the other part of the question was, uh, who is high intensity training for? Yeah, firstly, you described that much better than me, and I left out some of the key uh, tenants, such as safety and, and controlled cadence and things like that. So I appreciate you oh, no hammering that home. <laughs> um, who's it for? So obviously, this is going to sound really cringe, but it's basically for everyone. You know, whether you're a you know a, a teenager who is looking to get better a better performance in their sport. Um, or it's just looking to build muscle, it's ideal for you. If you're a senior person who is trying to regain function or regain lost muscle or bone mineral density or quality of life, then it's absolutely for you and everyone in between. Um, you know, just a tangency related to this, I do think where some businesses go wrong in this area is that they try to target everyone it's very tempting when you discover hit that you're like oh everyone needs this therefore we must promote it to everyone but you know as as many of us know in business if you try and target and market to everyone you market to no one and uh, and so i do if there's anyone listening to this who is either thinking about starting a business in here or has one uh, and is struggling i would really encourage you to review this side of your marketing and decide who it is that you're actually marketing and selling to because it won't alienate the rest of them that you will still get people from those other demographics i just mentioned come through your door um but you really need to figure out who is a good fit for you your values you know your goals your business and, and that differs depending on you know what your 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 goals and your vision is for your particular studio yeah that's an excellent point and i, I like how you how you talked about targeting an audience but then I'll, you know of course you'll get other people and what are um some of the potential downsides of high intensity training in your mind or or who is it not for you know who who would you say oh you know high intensity training probably not right for you scott you know there is no downsides to high intensity <laughs> <laughs> it's a magic no, I'm kidding, bullet i'm kidding <laughs> um yeah, I, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is if you're a, and, and I think this is mostly going to resonate with the younger listeners. Um, if you love being in the gym all the time, um, and it's like almost a social event for you, uh, and something that you really enjoy and you like going frequently, then I'm not going to tell you to stop going and only go once or twice or maximum three times per week because, you know, you clearly get a lot of value out of going frequently um and so for those people you know I, th I think i'd be concerned with other things that those people might be doing that might be harming their joints and things like that you know exercises that really aren't that safe um but in terms of the volume and frequency i don't really see any issue with what they are currently doing so i would say that those particular individuals um I honestly struggle to think who else might not be a good fit because I could practically argue the value of a high intensity training regimen to um, most types of people of different um, ages. Um, because, you know, I was thinking about obviously before we did this podcast, Scott was asking you, you know, who 
you know, I had a, I could make a guess of the type of people that listen to your show. You know, I listen to your show, um, but I wanted to ask you to understand, you know, who might be listening to this um, and who would get obviously how I could then uh, add the most value. And I think one of the things you mentioned is, you know, a lot of people that listen to this um, are family people, you know, so they're probably quite time poor. I mean, a lot of us these days are quite, quite time starved. Um, and so anything that's efficient is attractive. Um, and the beauty of high intensity training is, as I said at the start of this podcast, it only takes, if you're doing it correctly, you're only in the facility for 15 to 30 minutes and you only need to train once or twice a week and you will get all of the benefits in terms of um, cardiorespiratory adaptations, muscle gain, strength, improvements in bone mineral density, um, you know, improvements to function and quality of life. Um, you know, I am really scratching the surface. That is the tip of the iceberg. The, the benefits from resistance training are are just vast. Um, and the stuff we're starting to discover now around um, the hormonal effects, the myokines is, is just, is just super exciting. And so I think that the return on investment on a mere 15 to 30 minutes training in this way, once or twice a week is enormous. So if you're someone who is sitting there going, you know what, I, I want to exercise, I know I should, I know I should perhaps do resistance training, but I can't possibly find the time to do it in my current schedule, then this is your solution. And so I encourage you, because I know, Scott, I'm, I'm assuming like 90% of your listeners are in the States. You guys have a ubiquity of high intensity training studios around the country. So I would Google your local studio and I would go and have a workout. Most of them do free consultations. You've got nothing to lose. It's only upside. Um, Sorry, sorry, guy. I've got another point, but you you can interject, Scott. No, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> the and the other thing, I think, you know, if again, if your listenership, I know, has some, you know, older people within it, uh, and so for those people that might be scared of the words intensity or high intensity, which is completely understandable, it's you know they're quite kind of aggressive words. Um, this is actually. Uh, ironically, the probably one of the safest methods of exercise, if not the safest you can embark upon. Um, and the reason for that is because although we are lifting heavy loads or, or moderate to heavy loads typically, um, and we're training to muscular failure, which again has scary connotations, the word failure, um, you're, you're actually, it's actually incredibly safe. And the reason for that is because you're moving, as you hinted at Scott, a very slow tempo. You know, you're, you're moving through each repetition, you know, the positive and the negative excursion of the repetition, um, in a very smooth fashion. And when you reach either end of the movement, you, you're, you should be using a very smooth turnaround. So that means it's very, very safe on the joints, um, in, in the body. Uh, so you're, you're not, you're, you're very unlikely you will, um, uh, have any high force on those joints, which might then um, cause an injury. Uh, and, you know, similarly, in terms of the, the training to failure, all that means is that as you're going through a set of high intensity training, you're recruiting all of the muscle fibers in your muscles. And so your muscle fibers are made up of slow and fast twitch muscle fibers. And we know unequivocally that in order to produce maximum adaptations from training, so all the benefits you get for, for your health, you need to recruit and fatigue the full spectrum muscle fibers. So that's the type one, the type two, the slow, fast twitch. And the only way to do that uh, that we know of is to actually train to a high level of intensity. Now, in terms of whether you need to train to failure, that's kind of up for debate. You know, um, some people would would attest that so, so long as you train close to failure, you're going to get the same outcomes. And, and maybe that's true. Um, but the reason I like to train to failure is because you can just make sure you've you've done it. You know, you've done the job. You know, if you've gone there, you've pretty much uh, recruited all of the muscle fibers and you know that that's going to be start the cascade for all of the positive health benefits that you're going to get from high intensity training. Yeah. Yeah. That's very well said. And I think for folks who, who are afraid of the safety at all, if you can just picture yourself doing push-ups and keeping doing push-ups until you literally try to push yourself off the ground and you get halfway up um, and then you, you sort of safely lower yourself back down, that's, 
that's what going to failure means. Um, so it's not like you're doing something where you're throwing a weight over your head or doing a clean and jerk or, um, you know, a heavy deadlift off the ground or something like that. And then, you know, you fail in the middle of the rep and you injure yourself. No, it's, it's very controlled movements, safe movements where stopping in the middle might cause, you know, some discomfort and some contractions in your muscles, but it's extremely safe. Absolutely. Um, and Lawrence, you've mentioned a lot of them. Doug McGuff, uh, I point people to your podcast, but what are some other resources uh, for people who want to learn more about high intensity training? Maybe check out videos on it or read about it before diving in or, or going to a studio near them, or maybe they don't have one near them. Yeah, uh, I would, well, first obviously point them to Doug McGuff's work, Body by Science. I would just look at Doug's uh YouTube video, which I believe is just Doug McGuff on YouTube. Um, and I think that's a great place to start. Doug has some videos way back in the archive where he talks about high intensity training and the benefits in a very wonderful way. Uh, you know, I don't think there's anyone on the planet who articulates it as well as he does because he really meets people where they are. It's something actually you've been doing really well, Scott, during this, uh, during this interview is, um, you know, explaining what I'm saying in an even more lay way, which I think is really important because it's so easy to forget that when someone's first coming across this stuff, they don't know as much as you might know. And so they're not going to perhaps understand what you mean when you're talking about it. Um, and I think Doug does that wonderfully well uh, in a lot of his early videos in, in terms of providing analogy um, to help people understand you know, just what this type of training is doing for them and, and why it's, it's probably the best approach out there for most people. Um, so aside from his resources, I'm not going to plug my own <laughs> because <laughs> Go I'm ahead. Sure we've kind of already done that. But so maybe some of my early podcasts would be helpful. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I, I I would rather not say anything beyond that because I don't want to overwhelm people. Yeah, and I think that's actually good. that they'll get what they need from Doug's most of Doug's work. I yeah, think. that's a, that's yeah. a great great way to put it. And yeah. of course, there are many other resources, but yeah, it's good to start small. Um, and what what's your tr- current training look like, Lawrence? Maybe you could talk people through one or more of your workouts, the frequency, the number of sets, et cetera. What's it look like? And, and do you any, do anything in addition to the strength training sessions um, like cardio or, um, you know, walking, mobility, et cetera? Yeah. So I will tell you, so to make this not boring, I will not tell you what I've been doing recently because I actually injured my shoulder playing basketball. Ah, another um, basketball injury. Yeah, another one. Exactly. Don't play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you can earn millions of dollars. Um, and so because of that injury, um, I've not been able to play basketball uh, and I've not actually been able to train properly. Um, and it's a, it's basically like shoulder tendonitis in the bicep tendon um, and it's been really debilitating and it's actually been in the, you know, lingering around now for a few months. And um, I've got some things on the go, some like, you know, uh, new workout programs to address that. And I've had some very, very smart people help me with that, which I'm very grateful for if you're listening. Um, and so hopefully we'll get, we'll heal that and it will be, uh, we'll be back to normal soon. However, um, before that happened, <laughs> uh, I was doing a training program which um, was created for me by uh, my friend and one of my podcast guests, Gary Knight, who's a um, Aussie high intensity trainer, uh, really smart guy, really really good guy, and um, he. Uh, so I was doing a, a, which is a little bit counterintuitive to obviously what we've been uh, saying, uh, but it was a freeway split. So it was free workouts done Monday, Wednesday, Friday. One was a push routine. So things like chest presses, uh, dumbbell overhead press, lateral raises, any sort of pushing away from the body movements done with a single set to muscular failure. Um, then a pull routine. So pull downs, rows. Uh, shrugs, uh, things like that, bicep curls, uh, the all important bicep curl, uh, <laughs> and then a, a legs routine, um, which was as would suggest, you know, things like leg press, leg extension, calf raises, things like that. Um, so that, but it was still a very brief, brief routine. So each workout would probably only take me 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but it was slightly higher frequency. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, with a likelihood that 
after doing it for a certain amount of time, I probably move to a twice a week protocol. So you're looking at twice a week, 10 to 15 minutes per session. Um, and, and then kind of prior to that, I was doing typically twice a week, uh, machine based training. So, um, just probably doing a B routine. So the, the reason for the AB is to, cause I, I tend to do better on lower volume. So less exercises, but obviously the downside to that is you may cover less musculature and ideally your program should cover the entire body over a period of a week or two um and so i would do a b routines just to make sure that i got enough volume over two sessions to cover my entire body so that's my kind of situation and kind of recent routines i've been doing i mean more recently my routine so i did one yesterday and I had very little time yesterday. And so I had to kind of sneak a home routine in and I've got, you know, a, a, a chin up bar and bits and bobs I can use at home in order to get a workout in. And that was just a, you know, a full body workout with some, uh, time static contraction neck work. So neck extension, neck flexion. You know, I'm sure Scott can perhaps link to some stuff that might explain yeah. what that is to people because I, I'll be here all day explaining it. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then, uh, chin ups. Uh, push ups, uh, rows with a TRX type device, uh, crunches, prone trunk extension, which is just a, a movement for the lower back. Um, and then I finished up with a load of shoulder rehab stuff, um, which included, um, a shoulder isometric exercise, um, which I don't know how else to describe, but it's kind of a basically contracting the shoulder in four different positions um, and then also some isometric external rotation internal rotation work which is really just to try and rehab and strengthen my right shoulder i also started doing some hanging um courtesy of uh dr bryce lee who i think um was following i think it's dr john kirsch who's kind of the expert when it comes to hanging and how it can improve shoulder strength and shoulder health um so i've been doing kind of like free 20 25 second uh, hangs uh, every day actually um with the theory being that high volume approach to the tendons and ligaments in the shoulders might be better uh, and more effective um and so yeah that's kind of what i'm doing and then i um i don't play basketball at the moment i i'm almost this is the first time i'm saying this scott i might retire uh, I, might, I might give it up i don't know i don't want to but the actual the shoulder injury has been quite debilitating and at times almost quite depressing um and with I'm a baby really sorry coming, to hear that that's cool uh with a baby coming i actually want to be able to lift them up um and so <laughs> there is that to think about uh, but who knows maybe I'll, I'll, I'll return to it in the future um but yeah i mean I, I'm, I try to be as active as possible we have a small dog and i walk the dog two three four times a day so that's kind of my cardio quote unquote cardio um <laughs> so that's it really from a training pers- and a, a kind of movement perspective yeah, sounds extremely healthy and appreciate you going through that with people cuz I think they'll be curious and really appreciate that and um I think it's a it's a good overall model. Uh but really sorry to hear about the injuries Lawrence. I am uh that that's I know how frustrating that can be having sports injuries in the past myself. Right. No, I appreciate that, man. Um and how about the nutrition side? Um you know Folks will be curious. You know, I have a lot of folks on here who are fully carnivorous. I have folks on here who are not carnivore. I have folks on here who eat some meat, not a lot of meat. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel bashful about, about <laughs> anything. Uh, but, but curious what, you know, your daily eating looks like and maybe how it's evolved over time, um, alongside your training. Yeah. So. I have been heavily inspired by you actually on the, on the eating front, certainly over the last couple of years, massively. <laughs> so. Um, like in terms of my, I just give you a quick view on how it's evolved for me. So I think I, I went from obviously like most people standard American diet or something similar to that when I was younger and not really caring about diet to very quickly being, uh, uh, embarking on kind of a low carb keto approach um playing around with tim ferris's slow carb diet um and then kind of moving them more towards a more liberal low carb diet which just seemed to work for me i'm not saying that everyone should do that or, or any of the diets i might mention here that any everyone should do and um, it's just stuff that's really worked well for me and i'm certainly not the nutritional expert um but 
I would say people that have really been a big influence on me uh, lately are yourself, Scott, um, you know, in terms of the stuff you've shared on Carnival Cast. And then I've just, I just really like uh, Dr. Paul Saladino. Um, I've got a lot of time for that man. I think um, he's the first person who, well, I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of people you had in your show that have been just awesome. Um, but what I like about him is his ability to dive into the nuance and the biochemistry and actually talk about that in a carnivore diet context. Because I've not seen anyone do that until yeah. he did it. Not not in the detail he does it. Yeah, um, he has he has a unique smart guy. combination. Sorry to interrupt. Of being extremely oh, yeah. articulate, very strong memory, so, strong uh, critical thinker with a scientific base of knowledge. Um, I think it's really and, and very charismatic, and I think it's rare to have all of those in one package. <laughs> the trifecta, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and he's he's also uh, yeah, his recall is is unbelievable. Like I I can't like I listen to old podcasts I do, and I I I I, I just kick myself because I'm like, why didn't I remember that? I asked that same question <laughs> four times. I mean, I don't know if that's happened to you, Scott, but I asked the same bloody questions, and I it would sound like to some of my guests that I'm not really learning anything because my recall is is not like this guy. Um, but yeah, so he's been enormously influential, um, and so at this point, uh, my diet is pretty much. I would say 90, 95% carnivore. You know, typically I'm eating twice a day. Uh, I, I usually, I, at the moment, I skip breakfast. And I typically have my first meal around uh, anywhere from kind of 11 to 1 in the afternoon. Um, and then I have my dinner around, I try and have it around 5, 6 p.m. Uh, and that's more because of the whole like circadian rhythm thing and not wanting to eat too late because it really does seem to affect my sleep. Um, and my meals usually consist of, I eat quite a lot of ground meat, um, and ribeye, egg yolks, um, liver. I eat quite a lot of liver now. Um, I tend to season it all with the, the sea salt that you guys typically recommend. I think it's the Redmond sea salt. Yep. Um, so I use that, uh, but I do deviate. I do have, you know, if the missus wants to cook a, a vegetable bake thing, I'm going to eat it. Um, you know, I might have the odd chocolate bar like once a week. I don't tend to have cheat days anymore. I used to have these days where I went absolutely bonkers and eat loads of crap. Um, but I do not think that they're very intelligent things to do anymore. Uh, but I will, you know, if let's say, you know, a Saturday for a typical Saturday might be, a, it might, I might fast for practically the entire day. I might make sure I get some liver or some kind of highly nutritious food in there. But then I might go out for dinner with a friend or with, you know, my fiance. And then I'm quite liberal and I'll just eat, you know, whatever's going and, I'm not too fussed about that. Like I, I will say I do have a kind of conflict. Still, I still have conflict with this guy. And you and I have spoken about this tons. Yeah. About this whole balance between quality of life and pleasure, and happiness, <laughs> versus you know eating this perfect diet. Um, and somewhere in the back of my mind, I think that it probably you can have it all in that if you can eat a, a purely healthy diet, um, which, you, you know, let's say for argument's sake, a pure carnivore diet is the healthiest, most optimal diet there is, um, that you could be incredibly happy and, and be quite content foregoing all of those cheat foods, knowing that you feel wonderful every day, right? Um, and I certainly, you know, I see that in you, Scott. I see that in my friend Art Lichtfoot, over in uh, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, and and a couple of other guys, Mark Strauss, another one, where you guys just to me seem to have this awesome discipline, and you inspire me. And where the way I see it is, as I go through my own nutritional journey, I'm sort of trying to get to where you are, but I'm not quite there yet. But I'm making improvements every single day. Yeah. Um, you know, I was addicted, for instance, dark chocolate was my thing, right? So I was having dark chocolate once or twice a day, uh, quite a lot of it, you know, um, and I have just got rid of it completely. And it, I've, I've had no cravings for it. Yeah. You know, I think it was someone scared me away of heavy metals or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, I, I don't think yeah. I, I've come, I've come around, um, on thinking, you know, hundred percent compliance all the time is optimal and that'll make you the happiest. Um, to, I think it depends on the person. 
I think for someone with autoimmune conditions um, who, you know, has a flare up or an issue with their gut or their skin or their mind or their arthritis, if they have even a small amount of something off of a, a fully carnivorous, um, fully uh, animal based diet, um, th- then they they should probably stick to it and they will be happier if they don't. Uh, quote unquote, I don't even like the word cheat, but, but eat a food outside of their normal eating pattern. Um, but I think for someone like you who's healthy and has great metabolism, works out, normal body weight, like, you know, if it, just like you said, if it improves your quality of life, if you're in a social setting and it makes you feel, um, better and more connected with the people you're with and, you know, you have a, a pizza or a beer or two and like, you're back, you're back on it the next meal, the next day. Like, I, I really can't see that, you know, five or 10%. Uh, affecting you super negatively. And I mean, you're talking about having a chocolate bar every few days. It's probably like a nice, healthy, high, high, uh, cocoa, dark chocolate bar. Right. So like, oh, no, really. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, anyway, it's, it's still like, it's still not a big deal if you don't feel it affecting you super negatively all the time. Like you probably don't feel great for a few hours afterwards, but you know, life is short. And, um, well, I prefer being, 100% compliant um, when I'm doing something. Um, there are a lot of people who can moderate better than me, and I sometimes envy them. Um, and there's something to be said for that. Um, and you know, I, I especially think when you combine it with an intelligent strength training, resistance training program, it can really uh, moderate a lot of the effects of these negative health foods. You know, people did not get sick and fat who are exercising well, like you and I are metabolically healthy, low body fat. And then they started eating, you know, fruit and rice and potatoes and, or, or maybe even like pizza once a week. And then all of a sudden they're, you know, overweight, metabolically diseased and all these things. Um, you know, the problem started from eating these ultra processed foods all the time, 24 seven and not exercising and not getting proper sleep and managing stress and all these things. So, uh, it's a little bit of a rant. Sorry, but <laughs> I, oh, I just really changed my, changed my mindset on it a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I agree. Um, I will just correct. I don't, I don't typically have, I'm just a bit embarrassed about this. I don't typically have a chocolate bite every few days. I would say that every now and again, rather than save maybe that, that, uh, less healthy meal for a Saturday evening, um, I would maybe have some random treat, so to speak, sure. for one of a better label, uh, during the week. So I don't want people thinking that every three days I'm devouring a Mars bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I think I, that, yeah. that's fine. You know, um, someone who I'm, Super excited to have on the show soon is uh, Jerry Tex- Texera. I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his name correctly, but JT. Um, he he has uh, body weight strength uh, on YouTube and um, on Twitter, and he's in- extremely healthy, ultra jacked, great father, great guy, teacher, very generous individual. And um, I think up until very recently, he was essentially carnivore uh, plus you know some dairy. Um, hundred percent of the time. And then like every two weeks he'd go out for dinner with his kids and have a ton of sushi or a pizza. And I think that's just a very healthy way to live if that doesn't um, exacerbate some underlying health condition or other issue for you. Yeah, I agree. And that name rings a bell, actually. I, I think I might have seen his work. I uh, know it looks looks pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult, right? I heard, I heard Ben Greenfield and Paul Saladino talking about this. And um, I kind of... Uh, you know, um, somewhat agree with Ben when he talks about just how food is so interwoven with culture and tradition um, that it's 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 hard sometimes to remain so disciplined uh, or, or, or strict during some of these kind of family or social gatherings. Um, and, and I think that's something I really admire about you, Scott, is like, I know some people might think, you know, they hear what you do when you're with family over Christmas and that you're just eating like, I don't know, whatever it is, an entire joint of meat or whatever. Um, and they think, <laughs> oh, that's, there's something wrong with that. And I'm like, no, like if he's fine, it's, it's, it's down to the individual. And you know? if, if, if he is happy and, and can, and behave normally uh, and do that and have no issue, then I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it really depends on, on who you are and, and your preferences and how you behave in those certain settings, given those those options. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Totally. That's, I, I agree with much of what you said. I think it's fine to be 100% compliant if that's what you prefer. I think the problem arises when people have this air of moral superiority by saying, you know, oh, what's wrong with you? Can't you just tell people you don't? You don't want that or why Why can't you just always be compliant? Like why do you need to derive your happiness from food, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think you know people just shouldn't, shouldn't judge each other too harshly for things totally. like that. Um, anyway, moving on a little bit. How, so how has changed your style of eating? Um, how, how is your current style of eating you know, affected your physical and mental performance? So I would say – I had a few really interesting observations. So firstly, one thing I love about the carnivore diet is that I just do not feel hungry very often. It's very satiating, right? I think that's, that's a common report you get from people that do this. Um, and so, you know, um, I can quite happily do even one meal quite often. Um, it's perfectly fine for me. And so from an efficiency point of view, going back to efficiency, uh, it's very attractive. Um, but a couple of things I've noticed is when I'm really good with it and I stick to it for a long period of time, my sleep requirements are a really interesting change. So I notice that I will wake up at sometimes 4.30, 5 in the morning, having had maybe six, seven hours sleep and be just ready to go, just ready to just on fire, like ready to wake up, you know, seize the day, crack on and be industrious. And it's like, it's, it, it's very stark. It's, it, it's, I, I, I don't feel like, you know, people might hear that and say, oh, that's very cute, but that's hardly scientific. And it's probably not. But for me, it's like it's a very clear kind of correlation with when I changed my diet to that. I just seem to wake up, you know, really early quite often and just ready to go and feel really inspired. So that's interesting. And when I do deviate off it, when I start having more carbohydrate, more cheese, you know, dairy, what have you, uh, or even some of the, the less healthier options. I, I don't get that. I don't get that benefit. Yeah. And so I don't know why that is. Maybe you could educate me, Scott, but I'm guessing it's got something to do with the, the perhaps the detoxing or the, the production or processes that are happening during sleep that just seem to be less encumbered uh, and more efficient during those hours. And so perhaps I need less time to, to get that job done. Um, and so that's been really interesting, um, just just having more energy in the morning. And then I would just say, generally speaking, my ability to have focus, um, you know, throughout the day is greater. So, you know, I've already had a pre-productive morning. It's 2.15 in Ireland right now. And I'm pretty, I feel quite cognitively healthy um, and, and high energy-ish for this time. Whereas I can't say that when I'm on um, other diets. Uh, and so I think that that may play a role for that as well. Um, from a body composition point of view, yeah, I mean, I'm effortlessly able to stay around 10% body fat, um, which I wasn't surprised about, uh, you know, that that would be one of the outcomes. So yeah, I mean, from a a uh, muscle mass perspective. Um, I, I haven't checked it in probably a month or so, um, but my, I, I would say for me, it would seem that my, uh, that my muscle growth is very, very slow now where I am in my training. I mean, we, we could debate that at length, Scott, because I know that you've made changes that have been really positive for you in that regard. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if, if for me, um, it's made a big difference from a muscle gain perspective. But then you could argue, well, if I did 100% carnivore, very strict, much like you, Scott, for a long period of time, would I see a big benefit in terms of the aesthetic and, you know, my, my amount of muscle mass? Possibly. Um, so yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll, uh, experiment more of that in the future. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting, and, and I've experienced a lot of the same benefits myself. But uh, always good to hear it, hear from you, and and thanks again for the kind words regarding <laughs> in, in inspiring you. You know, if anything, all I've done is is repackage and regurgitate what much smarter people have said. Um, and what challenges, Lawrence, are you trying to solve both personally right now, and and same for professionally? You know, what things are you working on? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, I think personally, um, I'm trying to rehab this shoulder <laughs> is my is my real focus right now It's just trying to live a lifestyle, you know, follow certain movement patterns that just don't uh, 
don't impact that recovery in a negative way uh, and then train appropriately. So that's really my focus um, personally in my own training. You know, I've got a baby coming in November, so that's two months away. So I'm under a fair bit of pressure to deliver uh, financially and in terms of, you know, being there and all of that. I've got some very exciting professional projects happening. Obviously, I've got very much focused on the hit business membership and um, which is which is my my product behind the high intensity business blog and podcast where i help people privately grow their high intensity training business um with proven blueprints that i've put together with the best in the industry people like luke carlson and patty Durrell and these people who have really nailed the systems that help build a successful business um, and we also have monthly q and a's in there where you get to ask these people questions live every single month uh, and there's a community of high caliber high intensity training business owners and trainers and scientists who are there to help each other within the forum and help you with your business and your training um, and we've pre pretty much got all the big names in high intensity training or at least most of them within the, the community now which is awesome um, but but related to that one of my one of my projects I'm so excited about is, and uh, you might not know, Scott, is I'm actually opening a studio here in Galway, probably in awesome. January 2020. So January 2020 is our rough date. Um, it's it's very kind of you know uh, approximate at this point. Um, and what's really fun is I can take everything I've learned from the podcast and from the membership and actually implement that in our project. And then I can report back. I can document. I can create more value on the podcast and the membership, which is so exciting for me. You know, I've just gone through a whole process, for example, where we've um, pretty much landed on what we want as the name of the business. Now, I can't say that yet because it's still confidential, but um What's been really fascinating is learning how to come up with that name and talking to people how they name businesses. And so I've taken that entire standard operating procedure. You know, how do you name a business? What are the filters that you use to think about your business, your name for your business? You know, things like, do you need to get the dot com if it's a global brand that you're going for? And um, does it relate to your strategic niche? These are the types of questions that will help you decide and things like that. Um, and so being able to actually map that out and put it in the membership as an SOP, as a here is a checklist for people, is so useful to the members, right? Because if you're thinking about starting a studio, and you're like, oh, what do I name? I have no idea. Here you go. Here's a, you know, a solution for that. Um, so it's, it's what I'm trying to say is all of the projects that I'm working on are all very kind of symbiotic. They all kind of feed into and help one another, um, which just gives me an enormous amount of motivation. And so professionally, uh, the two main projects for me are, are really uh, growing the membership, um, producing great content and value in there, starting the studio, but then continuing with the high intensity business podcast. And, you know, I produce two episodes at the moment every single week um, on the subjects of personal training and also uh, growing your your high intensity training or all personal training studio. Um, so, yeah, loving, loving it, loving life. That's awesome. It all it sounds like you've done a beautiful job of <laughs> integrating, you know, your passions, work, life, um, and also multiple businesses that interrelate and benefit from one each other, one another, which which I really respect. Um and, and I'm super glad for you. Um and so uh, uh I'll link to everything in the show notes at carnwordcast.com, Lawrence, but where can people find out more about you and, and what you're up to? I would just send them to highintensitybusiness.com. Great. You go there, you'll be able to go to the contact button and you can send me an email. My email address is there. So, yeah, happy to help anyone who's got questions about this way of training or anything else we talked about. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Lawrence. It's been a real pleasure have you on. I think you've delivered a ton of value for the listeners um, and always great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been an honor. Thank you. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. 
You can also email me at info at I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.